Salutations once again to the Truth Core, whoever or wherever you may be on the planet. This is your friendly neighborhood Gnostic, John Lamb Lash, with the ninth episode or the ninth installment of Gnostic Sabotage in the Book of Revelation. And today, I'm going to tell you something, as much as I can, about the great whore of Babylon. Who is the great whore of Babylon exactly? And where does that identity, which is defamatory, come from? So let's see what I can tell you about that notorious woman who of course appears in the 18th chapter, 18, note that, of the book of Revelation. And she appears as the scarlet woman riding upon the great beast. Now remember, the number of the beast is 18. Seven heads plus 10 horns plus the whore of Babylon. I'm going to approach it from a certain angle that might seem odd, but it's instructive and helpful. Back sometime, I don't know when it was, maybe in the 70s, there was a big scandal in the UK, and it was called the Profumo or Profumo scandal. And so Profumo was a man high placed in the British government. And he got involved with two call girls. They were named Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davies. And when that scandal broke, which was a threat to security, put that all in quotes, right? Uh, it was an international news item. It's remembered to this day by many people. And there was a movie based on that scandal called Scandal, which is quite entertaining to watch. Let's just take this name, Christine Keeler. It's a name of a woman. But as events have developed, both at that time and afterwards, to this day, if that name comes up, it, could, it has a shock value. Oh, Christine Keeler, Hooker, yeah, the Profumo Affair, and so forth and so on. So you can say that the Profumo Affair is an historical event which survives as a kind of anecdote in the collective memory. So whether or not anyone today, say in England, remembers the details of that scandal, the name Christine Keeler may ring a bell, just like the name the great whore of Babylon rings a bell, and it rings an alarm bell. But what kind of alarm is that really? What is so alarming about her? Correction, it's in chapter 17. And that's also fitting because the number of the beast is 17, isn't it? According to the composition of that monstrous animal. But then you add one other factor to the beast. So listen to what it says. Come here. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great harlot that sitteth upon many waters. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names and of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and bedecked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. 
and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Well, isn't all that just one huge screaming outrage? But what is it all about? Something is quite notable in scripture, in the Bible, in the English translations, of which there are many. And this is, by my observation, a strange convention using capital letters. There are places in the Bible, I think in the Old Testament perhaps as well, where they use capital letters, not sure, but perhaps the passage where the demented alien God, Yaldabaoth, proclaims to Abraham, I am that I am, don't ask me who I am, I know who I am, you don't know who I am, you know. Whatever that passage says might have been also printed in capitals. Why is it printed in capital letters? You know, if you write an email or post an entry on a YouTube comment section in capitals, what are you doing? Well, you're, it's the equivalent to screaming at somebody. So literally this passage, verse five in chapter 17 is screaming out the name of the great whore of Babylon, but actually it isn't. It's screaming her defamatory title. It doesn't say her name. It calls her Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's her designation, but where does this designation come from? Why is the mysterious figure of the great whore always represented in this attitude of outrage? Oh, blasphemy. Oh, horror. Oh, scandal. What's, what is it all about, Rome? Well, let's see if I can tell you what it's about. But I do want to say and hear I speak as a self-educated scholar. I'm not an expert on everything. So here's a cautionary comment. I don't know, I have never encountered any material in ancient writings that would explain this, would explain this association, this defamatory language attached to the great whore of Babylon. Now the theme of the whore, the peredros, the sacred prostitute, has a considerable degree of content, ancient evidence, and an enormous degree of scholarly commentary. And the Aeon Sophia herself has been described in very fragmentary sources as the whore of wisdom. So there are some clues, there are some tropes that may be associated with this defamatory language, but the ultimate basis of the story, as far as I know, is unknown and cannot be found in any of the clues about the great whore or the archetypal image of the whore. So hold on tight, and I'm going to take you on a little adventure. Now, I'm not going to take you down a rabbit hole, or what I prefer to call a rabbi hole, most certainly not. I'm going to take you down something that's more like the honey hole, if you know what I mean story goes back to a place and the place is Samothrace and it must be true because it rhymes. 
Now, Samothrace is this tiny island in the Aegean. And scholars of ancient history and of the mysteries and the history of religions will tell you that Samothrace is the exact place where the most ancient surviving knowledge of the mysteries comes from. Did you know that? That's a remarkable and important detail. So there were mysteries all over ancient Europe, Europa, as I prefer to call it, and many mystery centers around the Mediterranean basin. And one of them was on the Greek island of Samothrace. Scholars admit that they know virtually nothing about the mystery cult located on that island. They don't know the details and the specific information that I'm giving you now. It is a fact, though, that scholars know that certain mystery cults were handed down the, the care, the guardianship of mystery cults was handed down to certain families. For instance, if you look at the uh, Eleusinian mysteries, which are the most well-documented, scholars tell you that there was a family, I think it was called the Eumopides. There was a Greek family living in the area of Eleusis, and it was their familial responsibility to guard the sanctuary. They were not necessarily the initiates of the sanctuary, but they were the family guardians of the sanctuary. The same applies to the mysteries of Samothrace. There was a family on the island, and they were called the Diopthrides. And that family was responsible for preserving the sanctuary of the mystery cell that was specific to that location. Remember that all mystery cells, although they shared the same foundation, were bioregional. So the initiates adapted the mysteries to the mindset of the people in the region where their cults were established. All of the mysteries had as their central figure the great goddess the Aeon Sophia, Mother Earth. But the procedures of the mysteries, the practices, varied by regions. And one particular characteristic, and scholars do report this, by the way, I would call it the defining characteristic of the cult, mystery cult of Samothrace, was duality. But that's all that scholars know. They don't know, well, what, what sort of duality? What does that mean, the word duality? It's, it's, a, it's a lost clue. You can't really trace it up anywhere. How can you confirm it? Well, I'm here to tell you that the duality that was specific to the cult of Samothrace was sexual. And so, the initiates of that cult practiced sacred sexuality. So the duality was the duality of the gender binary, male-female. And so the priestesses of the cult of Samothrace were, in one respect, if you want to use a crude term, which is acceptable among scholars, sacred prostitutes. And they were initiates into the mysteries of sexuality, and their role was to initiate men into that role. I've talked a lot about this in the past. So the family of the Diopthrides were the guardians of that sanctuary. And it just so happened that one of their daughters, B, 
became an initiate in the sacred rites of sexual mysticism. Now, this was not always common. The familial guardians of the sanctuary had their role, and their role did not imply that anyone from the family would be an initiate in that sanctuary, but sometimes this occurred. It occurred at Eleusis as well. So it so happened that one of the daughters of the family of the Diopthrides became such an initiate. And her name, her first name, was Merante. Now, Merante is a name that survives in Greek today for a woman with a variant, Mariante. That's a Greek name, which means something like Miriam in Greek. So her full name was Merante Diopthrides. That is the complete name of the woman who is behind this notorious identity of the whore of Babylon. But how did it come to pass? How did it happen that she acquired that defamatory title? The story goes like this. In those ancient times, before Christianity, there were social organizations in the Middle East which are called theocracies. And these theocracies were established in many places. One of the centers of them was the ancient city of Babylon in the Fertile Crescent. So Babylon was a theocratic society. And the theocratic societies were ruled by men. But around them, or shall I say, the historical context of many centuries in which these theocratic societies arose was established by the presence of matrifocal cults, cults of the great goddess, which were populated and directed by women. Now, it so happened that the Mystery School network in the past was vast and the different cells were in communication with each other. So it came to pass that the mystery cell on Samothrace, in which Marante was an initiate, learned about certain events in Levant and in the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia. And these events were quite alarming what they learned was that the sister cells of the matrifocal initiates of sacred sexuality, do you follow that? Were experiencing disturbances and disruptions in that area around Babylon. And this news came to Samothrace. And so it turned out that Merante, when she was only in her mid-twenties, was invited to go there and consult with the elder women on this problem. So she went to a mystery cell in the region of Babylon. Now bear in mind that the cult centers of sacred sexuality or sacred prostitution as it's crudely called, were never in the cities. They were never in the urban centers. They were always outside somewhere, in the sacred groves, in the mountains, in the beautiful forested areas around the city. So it happened that Marante went there to see her sisters in the cult and her mothers and she was invited to go there in order to consult with them on some things that were happening. The main thing that concerned them was that the theocrats 
who establish themselves as lords and rulers in the great urban centers like Babylon were interfering with the mystery cults of the great mother or the divine feminine, if you want to use the abstract expression. But how were they interfering? Well, you see, the men who established themselves as theocrats in those areas needed authentication. That is the word. In order for their rulership, their power, and their status to be recognized by the common people, they had in some way to be associated with these mother cults of the divine feminine. Because in those times, for millennia, the power of the man was based on his relationship to the goddess. The goddess conferred power and authority upon the man. That was the ancient system of matrifocal societies. And all this can be verified by an enormous amount of research, particularly, for instance, the re research of uh, Maria Gimbutas regarding old Europe and the matrifocal societies of the Balkans. And she wrote, Gimbutas wrote, several beautiful and intensely documented books based on archaeology mainly about these matrifocal goddess cults. So to cut the story short and get to the chase as rapidly as I can, get to the final scene, problem was that the men who declared themselves as theocratic rulers were no longer going to the goddess cults in order to be initiated so that they could be accepted by the community. You see, in the eyes of the community, both in the urban centers and out and around, it was essential that the ruler or lord of a city have the authentication of the goddess cults. Otherwise, his power was not considered to be legitimate. But through a long process that occurred over some centuries, the men decided among themselves that they would present themselves as the authorities for the city without having undergone that initiation, which gave them the stamp of approval coming from the mother cults. Can you see that? This situation developed over a period of time, some centuries actually, and eventually it reached a point where the male rulers of the urban centers decided that they didn't need that legitimation anymore, but they really couldn't get by without it. So they had to re resort to desperate measures and in fact, to quite violent measures. Now, how did they do that? There were various incidents involved, various cases, but by far the most famous of all was the case that involved Merante Diopthrides. She was resident in a mystery center of the divine feminine, the great goddess outside Babylon. And the theocrats from the city itself, the great urban establishment of Babylon, went out and they raided that cult center and they abducted her from that sanctuary. So the legend, if you want to call it that, of the great whore of Babylon goes back to an incident of abduction. So they brought her into the city and they needed her, the theocrat of that time, whatever his name may have been, needed her to display before the public, to show 
that he had authentically performed the sacred rites of sexual initiation, which would allow him to deserve the role of being a community leader. He had the approval of the mother cults, but in fact, he didn't have that. All he had was a young girl abducted from one of those cults. Now, what the theocrat of that particular time and setting wanted to do was to present himself before the public with a representative of the mother cult by his side. And in his view, that would be the action, that would be the ritual, the performance that would legitimate him in the eyes of the people. But Marante was not willing to go along with this charade. So the theocrat, king of Babylon at that time, and his entourage tried to persuade her. And she could not be persuaded because in fact it was a violation of sacred ritual. And she would not be his consort and his counterpart in the eyes of the people. She refused. If he had followed the traditional course of procedure, he would have gone out of the city and he would have spent some time in the precinct of the mother cult to be properly initiated. And that initiation was rigorous and he may have been approved or not approved, but he didn't care about that. He didn't want to go through that process or take the risk that he might not pass the test of initiation that he would undergo with a quote, sacred prostitute, unquote. So they brought her into town, into the city, and then they had a big problem. They had a performance plan to be conducted before the inhabitants of the city. And the stage setting for it was the ziggurat. So the main temple, the headquarters of the theocrat, was a seven-step pyramid, a ziggurat. So the plan of the theocrat was to present himself on the seventh level, symbolically in domination of the city and of that area of civilization of which Babylon was the capital. But Mirante would not participate in this performance. So they resorted to very desperate measures, measures of violation and brutality. And they in fact entirely violated the protocols and the traditional procedures that were required for the theocrat to be authenticated. They drugged her. In certain ways, they tormented or even tortured her. They abused her sexually, he did, and others as well. And they did all this in an attempt to break her down so that she would play the role of the representative of the mother cults who stood beside the male theocrat. They degraded her and they basically reduced her to something like, well, actually like an abused woman and they drugged her. They had to drug her because she refused to participate in this performance, which was a desecration of her sacred role in the cult of Samothrace. 
eventually the day came for the official enthronement ceremonies of the Theopra. And by that time, Mirante was in really bad shape, having been sexually abused, insulted, verbally abused, and having been drugged, she could barely stand up. So what they did was they uh, erected uh, a board, a post in the form of a flat board about five feet tall and say about a foot wide. And because she could not even stand up to appear to the population, they contrived a way, hiding it beneath her robes, to strap her to this board, this plank of wood. Then they constructed a tent, and inside the tent she stood, drugged, barely conscious, strapped to this board, and the theocrat, for his ceremony of enthronement, stood beside her. They erected the tent at the seventh level of the ziggurat, and at the key moment of the ceremony, they parted the veil of the tent, the entry, and there she was. Well, that spectacle was a very big deal. And it was really important for the theocrat to put on that charade so that he could be recognized and accepted by the general population. So on the day that the ceremony was announced, thousands of members of the city of Babylon, thousands of inhabitants gathered in the great square in front of the seven-step ziggurat. What happened then was something truly momentous. And it came from the crowd, the multitudes gathered for the enthronement. They looked up, they saw her, they saw the theocrat, they heard the ceremonies, which were elaborate, and they knew that something was very, very wrong. And they detected that this was a horrific fraud. It was not what the theocrat wished it to be. And so a wave of revulsion went through the crowd and they began to express their outrage and they began to shout and protest. And they said, this is not true. They knew among themselves that this was not true and they expressed their outcry and they said, this is not the genuine daughter of the mothers and of the mystery cult of the Divine Mother. This is the whore of Babylon. And in the recognition of the general population, there was, as I say, revulsion and outrage. In the performance that the theocrat was attempting to foist upon the population failed. And they went about screaming their protest and their outrage. And the incident became famous throughout the land by word of mouth. I don't know if there is any historical clue in any ancient records whatsoever that would point to this incident. But the result of the incident was that the condemnation, the defamatory term, the great whore of Babylon, became public knowledge. The performance was a failure. It was a tremendous scandal. And the scandal imprinted itself traumatically upon the minds of the people who had, for many generations, preserved their respect and their reverence for those women 
such as Marante, that came out of the sacred cults of the goddess. That was the blasphemy. It was a blasphemy not against Christianity or Judaism. This event occurred before Christianity existed, and it had nothing to do with the cults of Judaism, the tiny fractional cult of Judaism and the Zadokim that existed at that time. It was a scandalous affair in the life of the pagan peoples of the Fertile Crescent. That event registered in their collective memory and it was passed by word of mouth through the generations. The consequence was that even though the identity of that particular woman, Merante Diopthrides, did not survive, the memory of the scandal survived. Now, I cannot say if the Gnostic refugee who came to those caves, the woman, Zophrides, suggested this incident to the mad monk. It is likely that he knew about this incident because it was commonly known all over those areas of the Eastern Mediterranean. He knew of the term, the great whore of Babylon, and he knew that it was something scandalous and terrible, although he did not know the actual story of what happened. And so it also happened that the name of the great city of Babylon became associated with this scandal and it became associated with the mysteries, but in a confused and ignorant way. It was preserved in the collective memory and the folk memory, but in a jumbled way. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And in that language, in capital letters no less, it comes down to the world today through the book of Revelation without its origins being clearly or accurately known. It's probable that the memory and imagination of the mad monk itself picked up that clue. It wouldn't have had to be suggested to him by Zophrides, but it emerged out of his unconscious, his subconscious. Can you see that? And so he placed the notorious figure of that woman upon the great beast. And that concluded the number of the beast, 10 plus seven, plus one. The great horror of Babylon represents the desecration of the mother goddess of this world. She represents the desecration and defilement of the divine feminine. And that could be compared to a very great crime against humanity perhaps comparable to the crime that is underway as I speak these words. Certainly a crime of equivalent proportions. So what does the presence of the scarlet woman riding the beast mean? Well, it means that the revenge for that desecration is at hand and it comes in the correction of the Aeon Sophia. I'm not certain if the family name Diopthrides survives today in Greece, but I can tell you this, go put it into a search engine 
and spell it in just that way. And what will happen is that the search engine will correct the spelling and you will see the word D-I-O-P-T-I-R-I-D-E. That is an algorithmic correction if you put in the ancient name. And when you look at the hits that come up from putting in that name, well, go and see for yourself. The first hit goes to Gnostic sabotage in the book of Revelation. From yours truthfully, enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.